The one thing I want to start off with is by saying that if you haven't saved enough for retirement, there is no magic wand to solve the problem. It's a question I often get from people approaching retirement and in retirement who started off and they just haven't saved enough. The only answer is to keep working or go and live off your children, get revenge. Um, retirement to me, or retirement planning comes in two stages. It's the saving stage, which a lot of the earlier speakers have dealt with, and the spending stage. Um, I'm going to be dealing mainly with the spending stage um, in dealing with various products that you've got to consider. Now, one product is not necessarily better than another product. Much as Jenny spoke to you this morning about the tax behind the different products, it's what suits you, your income, your savings level. It can vary from person to person. What I'm going to try and do is point out the, the pros and cons of these products um, and how they will, can work for you or may not work for you. Effectively, on the saving side, we can, and also the spending side, we can divide products into two groupings. Those that are tax incentivized, um, in other words, it's the, the, the contributions come before you've paid tax on that money, so the, the tax man is helping you um, save, and then discretionary, which is from after-tax income. The products themselves on both sides, both the saving and spending it, can be very similar. It's just the, the tax wrapping around them that makes them different. Um, a retirement annuity fund is exactly the same product if you're buying a life assurance one as an endowment policy a product. It's just the tax advantages that you're getting on that endowment policy that underlies the retirement annuity fund. Um, the other difference, obviously, is where the funds, you're going to retire through a fund, even if it's a, a, a retirement annuity, that is a fund itself, on of, of itself. Um, whereas the discretionary one, uh, products can be different. But you go through collective investment schemes, but if you go through an RA, you can also invest in a collective investment scheme. Down policies, property, and exotics like art, carpets, and things like that. Um, and on the spending side, you've also got the same category. So I'm going to deal mainly with the um, tax incentivized products, and not the um, discretionary products, because that's what most people are saving through, for the bulk of their retirement savings are going to be through some sort of tax incentivized product, and as Jenny explained this morning, um, the money that you save through that product has to be used to, be, to purchase what's called a compulsory purchase annuity or a CPA. Um, Occupational retirement funds are mainly supported by employers or industrial bodies or trade unions. Um, you get defined benefit funds, defined contribution, umbrella funds. Um, umbrella funds, by the way, can be any of the above. Um, what they are is a collection of, of small employers normally get together, um, buy into a commercial product where they under, underlying individual funds, but it's managed as one big fund mainly to, to save costs. Um, initially, when these um, commercial umbrella funds came on the market, um, they were terrible. In fact, the worst fund in the company was something called the Wizard Fund, and uh, that was done by Sunlum. It even had a rule which said the trustees can't make rules. Um, it's come a long way since then, and now they've probably got one of the better umbrella funds on the market, where they realized when they got exposed just how embarrassing it could be. Um, and then you have ind individual vehicles, which are the retirement annuity funds and preservation funds, which I'm going to deal with in more detail. I'm going to run through these quickly. The, you'll have the, or the detail in your, in your pack. The fund benefit funds basically is that you were assured of, of a pension by your employer based on the number of years you, you were a member of the fund and your final paycheck or average check over the last few years of employment. Um, and then you have to buy two-thirds of it to buy, uh, to buy a, a pension. Um, if it's a pension fund, if it's provident fund, not so. Defined contribution occupational funds, basically the, the risk was transferred from the employer to yourself in that you take the risk that you're going to save enough money at, for retirement. The defined contribution could be made up from um, coming from yourself and from your employer. By the way, when we speak about... Um, the amount of contribution, I, I, like John spoke about, the average contribution is 13% to a retirement fund. That's your contribution plus your employer's contribution. So we're not always suggesting that the full contribution is going to come from your own pocket. It also comes from the employer's pockets as well. 
Um, and then defined contribution provident funds. The difference between the two is that um, on the, with the, the pension fund, you've got to buy two, use two thirds to buy a pension. And with the provident fund, currently, you can take the entire amount as a lump sum at retirement um, with the tax consequences in both cases. And I'll, but there are more pro different projects coming, which I'll deal with later. Retirement annuity funds. As um, Jenny pointed out, you can contribute 15% of non-pensionable income. In other words, you've got to first subtract your pensionable income in working out what that 15% is. Or if you're self-employed, and this is what the original intention of retirement annuities was, was to provide a tax incentivized um, product for um, self-employed people. But others can use it to top up. Again, you must use two-thirds of um, to, to buy a pension. A major difference between a retirement annuity, by the way, and an occupational fund is that preservation is already there. You cannot spend, you cannot withdraw the money from an RA until you reach the age of 55. And the same, by the way, applies to a preservation fund. Now, one of the more dishonest things that was inflicted on all of us by the, by the financial services industry was to say that we had to save um, through a retirement annuity until the age of 55. The law does not say that. The law says that you cannot withdraw the money before the age of 55. Um, and a lot of the, the problems around these confiscatory penalties of the life assurance industry were based on that, and I'm going to deal with that um, in a lot more detail now. When you buy a retirement annuity, You've got three choices effectively. You can buy what's called a unit trust retirement annuity. That's where one unit trust company provides the product. Um, you don't get fun any other funds. Often you'll get the funds of that unit trust management company. For most people, the best and easiest way and cheapest thing to do is to go to a, uh, to a, a collective investment scheme company and invest through their balanced fund where all the work, the asset attribution and allocation is all worked out for you. They come in different risk profiles, um, high equity, medium equity, and low equity, um, and they will meet the demands of most people. You don't have to get fancy about anything. You can just look at the consistent track record of that fund. Then you get linked investment product at retirement annuities, and they give you a choice of various asset management companies, but they come at an additional cost because you're getting that choice. So you can have a fund from Allen Gray, you can have one from Coronation, one from Old Mutual, a whole collection of them. Um, then you get life assurance RAs, and these are the traditional RAs, and these are the ones where the most problems lie. Um, a few years ago, Rob Roscroni, uh, an awesome actuary with a personality, by the way, um, exposed, did research that showed that Life assurance RAs were not only the most expensive savings vehicle in South Africa for retirement, they were about the most expensive in the world. The costs of these RAs, life assurance RAs then, he calculated would reduce the probable outcome at retirement after 40 years of saving by almost 50%. So instead of getting 100 rand a month, you would only get 50 rand a month. Obviously there are costs in any product, but these were so much higher, particularly than the unit, the unit trust RAs, which were among the lowest. In fact, it was quite interesting that for years, Old Mutual developed a product which was mainly used by its staff, a unit trust product, um, which was the cheapest in the country, and its, RA, its life assurance product was the most expensive. And when we discovered the product and we started writing about it, their sales staff denied, started denying it even existed. It was used by their staff. Nice guys. Um, but the worst thing about these life assurance products is they locked you in for 55 years. And what you didn't know, and what most people still don't know, is that they then calculated the costs, they paid the commissions up front, that's the other advantage of a unit trust and, and LISP um, RA, is that the commissions are only paid when you pay your contribution. Life assurance ones, they pay them up front. So if you, they could lock you in at, until the age of 55, 
particularly at the age of 20, nice fat commission coming their way, and the life companies just added their own profits for the full period and all sorts of other things, and they then issued you with a loan, which you were never told about, which in my view is a contravention of now, even now, the National Credit Act, which, and they're still doing it, and they decided on the interest rate you'd be paying, and they never told you about that either. So, you're 20 years old, you take it out, you reach the age of 35, you get retrenched by your company, you've got no resources, you've got children at school, you've got to feed them, and you've got a, a life crisis. Not of your own making, you either can't afford the money to pay over the money in the RA, or you've got to draw the money out of, out of the, the endowment policy, and the life company says, well, you're down on the ground, I'll kick you in the teeth again. I'm going to confiscate your money. Until, 19, uh, until 2005, they could confiscate up to 100%. Trevor Manuel intervened, cut it down to um, 30% for RAs, 40 for endowments, and um, in 2009, that was reduced on new products sold to um, 50, 20 and 15. But that's a heavy penalty to pay, even now. So my view is if you can't foretell the future and you're absolutely certain that you can keep paying those contributions, rather go for one of the other two options. More important part to me is what, how you spend it in retirement and assuming that you've saved enough um, to see yourself through. It's a danger point. It's not what it was with the defined benefit funds where you just automatically could be assured of, of a pension through retirement, but even they were dangerous because most of those funds only gave you increases that were equal traditionally to about 75% of inflation. So after some years, you're also going to start feeling the pinch quite significantly. Um, tax incentivized, um, you could have, mainly with defined benefit funds, you got a pension from, a, from your retirement fund. Um, or you could buy a guaranteed pension, you can buy a guaranteed pension from a life assurance company, or you've got this animal called a living annuity, which John spoke about. And then you've got those VPA products, which are much the same. Um, it's just called an income plan when it's with discretionary money or a voluntary purchase annuity. The main features of, of a CPA, it must be bought with at least two-thirds of the benefits you receive from, a, from the tax incentivized retirement fund. The only exception of it's below those amounts. Um, the full pension is taxed at your marginal rate when you receive payment, and there's no t tax on the investment earnings or capital gains residual. In other words, what John pointed out, how many, what, how many cents in every rand is coming from um, the returns you receive in retirement, that's another big tax benefit, is that it's not being taxed there's no capital gains tax, there's no dividends tax, and there's no income tax on the returns your money is receiving. The only tax that you pay is when you actually withdraw that part as a pension or a lump sum, and then there's also benefits at retirement as well on, on the lump sum. Um, there are numerous um, options with, the, with, with guaranteed pensions. Uh, uh, well, with pensions, I've put, divided them into three categories. A guaranteed life annuity, which comes, which come from life assurance companies, um, where they take the risk. Um, a with profit annuity, which is a hybrid of, of to my mind, of um, a guaranteed life annuity and an investment linked annuity. And I'll explain those differences to you shortly. The key elements in determining your, your guaranteed annuity, this is one that comes from a life company, are your age, the older you are, the greater the, the pension you're going to get because the life company expects you to, to die earlier. Your gender, the reason for that is that women tend to live longer than men. Uh, my version of it, as opposed to John's, is why do women, men live, die earlier than women? Because they want to. <laughs> um, interest rates, which John explained, um, because interest rates, most of what uh, uh, the money is going to be invested into bond markets and interest-bearing markets because that's lower risk. So interest rates have a huge impact on what pension you'll get and why they're so important. And then the choice of the annuity. Um, depending on what sort of annuity you buy, um, it'll also affect how much you pay for it. And in other words, how much you'll get as a pension. Um, this illustrates the differences between on different things. First of all, you can see the difference in, in, in age. The younger you are, the lower the pension is going to be. 
doesn't matter if you're male or female or married or not. 75, you suddenly start seeing those figures shoot up. Now, I'll go back to those figures later when I do a comparison between living annuities and guaranteed annuities. But it also shows there how males get more, that there seems to be a quirk in that a married female gets, gets a higher pension. It is a quirk. It's because it's worked. John, who did the, the research for me, says the, the reason for it is that um, women are t tend to be four years younger than their husbands, um, and that's, that's what causes that. Um, but the, the main calculation is that men are expected to live for a shorter period of time, so they get more. And it becomes very important, this, when you do have um, pensions which will go on paying until the last dying. Guaranteed annuities, you get various types, living annuities, es escalating annuities, guaranteed and then for life. A lot of it's jargon, and I'm going to start dealing with those one after the other. Um, a guaranteed annuity, a level annuity, not advisable unless you're about to drop dead on the first day of your pension. Because inflation, which we've been talking about all day, will chew into a level of, uh, um, annuity very, very quickly. Um, you just won't keep up with it. You'll run out of money very, very quickly. Um, as I say, the inflation rate of 4.5% a year reduces the buying power by 25% by every six years. So if you feel you can afford that, that's the way to go. The trouble with a level annuity is it starts up at a much higher level than the others. But this shows the effect of, of different inflation rates on a, guarantee, uh, on a level of uh, annuity. So uh, if you start off at 5,000 Rand, after 20 years, you're only going to be getting 1,000 Rand. And inflation will have gone in the other direction. So you're not going to survive, quite simply. You're not going to... I think the pair of socks, John, was a thousand rand, was it? Yeah, you'll buy yourself a pair of socks a month. Escalating annuities. Now, if you're going to get a guaranteed annuity, this is the option you should go for, because it will go up with inflation. Either you can select a predetermined amount of, say, 5%, or you can get one that's directly linked to inflation. Now, if you go for 5%, you just pray that Zimbabwe doesn't happen here. I don't think it will. Um, I think Zimbabwe was a total aberration. But imagine if you'd only even gone up by 5% a year in Zimbabwe. I don't know what the inflation rate record was, but it was well over 1,000% at one stage. Um, so you're going to be poverty-stricken. Anybody who knows anybody from Zimbabwe, they'll know exactly the position that Zimbabwean pensioners landed up in because of that. Um, you can't increase it by more than 20% a year if there's a guarantee. I will explain the 10-year guarantees to you just now, 10 or 20 or whatever, it and 15% without a guarantee. So there is a limit on the upper side. It's because of the risks that's, that are involved. Um, guaranteed and then for life. Life industry has been very good at gobbledygook over the, year, ma uh, over the years, mainly to confuse us. Um, so what this means is that if you buy an annuity, escalating annuity, level annuity, you can ask for the pension to be guaranteed for five years, 10 years, or 20 years. It's one way of getting money back if you think um, you want to leave something to your, your children or heirs. Um, and the pension will continue to be paid for 10 years if it's guaranteed for 10 years, whether you are alive or not. So if you drop dead six months after going into retirement, that will continue to be paid to whoever you nominate as a beneficiary for the, for the remaining 10 years. If you survive the 10 years, 10 years and one month, that pension will continue to be paid and will pay until the day you, and if it's a joint and survivorship, your spouse or partner dies, um, then it dies with you. Nobody will get anything from it. Get something called a capital back, back to, or what's called, commonly called a back-to-back -back structure where you buy an annuity, you'll use some of that annuity to buy a life assurance policy to pay out to beneficiaries if you drop dead. Sometimes there can be reasons for this. For example, if you've got a, somebody who, a, a, a child who cannot operate on their own, they're challenged in some way or another. Um, but on the whole, they're not a good idea. Um, in fact, there, there's an experience at the moment where a life company, which I'm not going to name, selling similar type products to this. Um, and the, life, the, the risk part of it was only guaranteed for a certain period, the premium. Those guarantees have expired. 
and they've tripled the premium. So most of the money that was coming as an annuity flow would now go to pay the premium on, on, on the life assurance policy. So you need to be very careful of that sort of thing if you do go for this type of, of option. Enhanced annuities. Now, if any of you are members of Discovery's Vitality, I think you get 5,000 points for not smoking every year and, and trying to get to your gold status. Well, this type of policy, they want you to smoke even more. But just so long as if you don't do it in here, you go out the door um, five kilometers down the road and I think you'll find a little lake and you can go and do it in the middle of that. Um, but there's only one company that sells these products. They are good for people who know at retirement that they've got a terminal illness and they, they expect to die young. Um, and then you will get a better rate from this company because they don't expect you to live a longer period. The other option, obviously, is a living annuity too because you'll draw down a certain amount. But here, the other advantage here is you can draw down quite a lot, which you're limited with a living annuity to 17.5%. If you're already being hospitalized, don't have medical aid, proper medical aid cover, it can be useful because you could get a very high um, premium, that's a very high pension that would be above that 17.5%, depending on the extent of your illness. Um, joint and survivorship. This is very important in any annuity you get, whether it's a guaranteed annuity, where this can be guaranteed, um, but you also need to take it into, a, into account with a living annuity. Um, and it's a tricky thing as well, because the, you have to decide what size pension the surviving spouse needs. Now, John gave you the figures showing that very few of us actually reduce our income when we retire. Traditionally, the amount that's been allocated to a surviving spouse has been 60% of the original pension. Is it going to be enough? You're going to have to work it out for your own circumstances. But the higher the percentage, the lower is the pension that you're going to receive right through the entire pension period. So if you've got an escalating annuity with guarantees and joint and survivorship, you're going to get far less as an initial pension than you would have got from a level annuity but the risks of the living annuity are inflation. Come to the with profit annuities, which I say are a category of their own. How a with profit annuity works is you go along with your money, you buy a pension from the life company, it guarantees that pension. The increases you receive, though, will be dependent on markets, on what market returns they get on that and by investing your money. If they're good returns, your pension will go up more than if they're bad returns. They smooth it out, try and smooth it out as well. Um, but there are problems with these as well. Um, in order to offer you a guarantee of any kind, a life assurance company has to keep reserves called capital adequacy reserves. Now the temptation here is that, the problem here is that with capital adequacy reserves, it's not just one amount to meet the promise it makes to you. It's got to look at the different asset classes. So the reserves it's got to hold for cash investment are very low as opposed to an equity investment. So the more that they invest in equities to get you returns on your product, on your annuity, um, the greater the risk they have and the greater the amount they've got to hold, which is basically idle capital. So particularly if markets turn, they're going to be very tempted to move your money out of the market when it's down, falling, for that, the, falling prey to that getting out at the bottom of markets, but for a different reason, to protect their capital and not have to put more capital into, to, into protecting your pension. So on the whole, they've, they've provided pretty good returns over the years, um, but there can be problems. Um, what you do need to watch out for is what's called the initial purchase discount rate. Now, some years ago, um, when a lot of companies were get con converting from defined benefit funds to defined contribution funds, they were also dumping their pensioners selling them off to life assurance companies because they were closing their defined benefit funds and so were no longer wanted to run pension, uh, defined benefit funds. Um, so they made this look attractive to a lot of pensioners and they went along to the life companies and they bought pensions for their pensioners. What the pensioners didn't know was that the discount rates they were using were sometimes as high as 8%. And what this means is that say the market return is 12% in one year. The discount rate that was, it was used at the beginning is deducted from the 12%, so you only get 4% of that 12%. Don't 
but it, by doing that, it enabled a higher initial pension. So the employers would go along and say, look, we're going to give you a fat big pension increase, um, which is much higher than the pension you're going if we can get the life assurance company to buy it from you. They didn't tell them about the consequences on future increases, and the good old enemy number one, inflation, has been chewing into those pensions ever since. And we keep seeing increasing evidence of this in complaints that we receive from readers. Now to get on to the other main choice, living annuities. I want to start off by saying there is nothing wrong with the living annuity product. There are risks attached to it, but it's a good alternative. I have a living annuity, um, and it works for me. I only draw down 2.5% from it, and I wouldn't draw down any if I had a choice, but I've got it by, uh, by law, um, because I've got other sources of income, I'm fortunate. Um, but you must consider them, but in, but in considering them, you must consider the risks. John gave you some of the risks, I'm going to give you a few more. The main things with them is that you've got to draw down between 25 and 17.5%. Um, if you're drawing down 17.5%, I'll show you just now that it's not going to last, you're going to get, turn and get to the failure rate almost in the first year. You choose underlying investments, risk, and you take the risk that there's going to be sufficient capital to maintain your stay in of living until you die. So that means you've got to take inflation in, into account, and then there's a residue left to your ears, if there is any. By the way, the one thing I can, uh, that's been said by previous speakers is consider yourself first, not your ears. They're not going to thank you. You're not going to be there to receive the thanks. But you might go hungry before it if you do do that. The drawdown. This is risk number one, and it's probably the biggest risk. N your initial drawdown shouldn't exceed 5%. Now, it's interesting that about two, three years ago, the first real research on living annuities was presented at an actuarial, con actuarial conference um, in Cape Town, um, in which it was shown that any initial drawdown above 5% of your capital, your money would not last, you'd re reach that breakdown point very, very rapidly. And then when I talk about the, the breakdown point, it's where you reach the maximum of 17.5% and your actual RAND income starts falling from that point because you cannot withdraw anymore. So whenever I talk about the breakdown, that's the point I'm talking about. Be conservative about the rates of return. Don't think, and a lot of these products were sold initially, people saying, oh, but you can invest everything you want in equities, not all in these interest investments that the guaranteed annuities go, give you. You're going to do well. Well, markets have shown that it's not necessarily the case. So be conservative in estimating how much you're going to be able to withdraw in the future. Um, one thing I can tell you, if you do draw down 2.5%, your pension is almost guaranteed to last forever. Now, a couple of years ago, the tax man got upset and, say, and, and National Treasury and said, these products that you're selling are not guaranteeing a purchase for life because the breakdown points are being um, reached. So CISA has issued a guidance. CISA is the um, Association of Savings and Investment. It's basically the industry association giving guidelines on what can be withdrawn and what's dangerous. Now, if you look at the top line, at where you've, the um, annual income drawdown is 2.5%, and if you're getting a return of 12.5%, your money's going to last forever. But draw down only 2.5%, and you only get a return of 2.5%, you're in trouble after 21 years. But if you go down the drawdown rates, just look how quickly you, you reach that breakdown point. Draw down 17.5%, and you hit that breakdown point in one year. Longevity. Most people, they sold living annuities, are told, oh, well, you can expect to live to, for um, until about the age of 84 if you're male, 86 if you're female. But that's on average. 50% of us are going to live longer. If you've reached the age of 65, the chances are you're going to live longer than 84, 86. And one person in a couple age 65 has a 52% chance of reaching age 90. Um, John also gave you figures earlier on, on, on survivorship. 
Um, and this, the scary one to me is this bottom one. The first person to live to 150 is already 50 years old, and that was two years ago. Next risk, market volatility. It was another point of mis-selling with these products, is that people said, okay, the markets have gone up by, on average by 8%, 9% a year um, for the last 10 years. So you're going to be fine. It doesn't work like that. If you're drawing money, capital, as part of your pension, when markets are down, it's going to take a long time to recover. Andrew will give you a lot of um, stats on that when he does his presentation. Um, adverse markets will damage your pension. It can push up your drawdown rate very easily. Now, when I first started looking at living annuities, and that was when we launched personal finance 18 years ago, um, I did this calculation and I published it. I've updated it slightly over the years, but not so much. And I got a phone call from a medical doctor who said to me, I was stupid, I didn't know what I was talking about, and I was exaggerating the risks. Well, I haven't exaggerated the risks because I took a 25% drop in the markets. 2008, I think the equity markets dropped by 40%. So I was being quite conservative. So you invest with one point, you start off year one with capital of 1.2 million. Person wanted 10,000 Rand consistent um, as a pension. So we aren't even taking inflation, the effect of inflation into account. After the markets crashed, 25% off, the drawdown rate immediately jumped to 13.3%. Markets leveled off in year two, but the drawdown rate has resu resulted in the capital being reduced to 780,000, um, and the drawdown rate goes up to 15.4, still getting the 10,000, but year three, capital's dropped to 16, 660, 17.5, and we've reached that breakdown point. This is realism. It's not and it shows you the effect of market volatility and why you have to take into account. Andrew's going to give you a solution to this when he does his presentation, um, when, which is one of a number of solutions, but I, I like his solution. It's something that I do. Flexibility. This is the flexibility to invest. And this comes with all the dangers of the flexibility to invest and what John was speaking about, fear, and greed, and we see it time and time again. It, if you look at, uh, another thing you can look at is what money goes into to money market funds. If you track that figure, you'll see money market funds explode when markets are down. And by the time people realize that the markets have gone up, they're investing too late. And you see the flow going from money market funds into equity funds or balanced funds, mainly balanced funds nowadays, wisely. Um, but there's that potential for self-imposed volatility. Um, flexibility, in my view, this flexibility to choose should only be used for diversification across asset classes and also to rebalance your portfolio. For instance, if you were, you were heavily into offshore um, investments at the moment, equities, and they, your values have gone, say, from 20% to 25%, but you only wanted 20% offshore, you would now be selling off that 5% and rebalancing, but you don't do it every day. Once a year is probably sufficient. Costs. This is something that's underestimated by a lot of people. Over the years, what the big problem obviously has been costs have been hidden. Now more and more costs have to be disclosed, although they have fancy ways of still hiding costs. Um, but they have an enormous impact. I was talking to you about the, what Rob Rusconi found in his research, and that was based on the percentage of costs. Now, one percentage point saved in costs in a build-up will give, increase your benefit by 20 years, another way of looking at it after 40 years. A 3% cost plus the initial um, drawdown of 5%, if you're drawing 5%, equals an unsustainable 8%. You've got to take that cost into account in assessing your drawdown. So even if you're drawing down 2.5% and costs of 3% 3, 3 are coming off, which I think is ludicrous, but they're there, because you, they're getting more, the other people are getting more than you're getting, um, that's 5.5% you're drawing. You're not drawing down 2.5%. If you're drawing 5% and your cost of 3%, that's 8%. So your drawdown is much higher than you actually realize it is. Here what 
I used a, uh, a slide done by, some research done by Ned Group Investments. Now, this is on actual experience. It's not theory, it's actual experience. The red lines show what happens if you're drawing down 8%. The blue lines show what happens if you're drawing down on 6%. Now, the scary thing about this, and it goes back to what, what John was saying, ex everybody's experience is different. You spoke about Vuzi and and his friends, what, Vuzi, John, and Red, yeah. And so you can land up in that blue line at the end where you, you're gonna be wealthy forever, and your children and their children's children in all likelihood. But you see how many blue lines are down at the bottom end as well. That's just market experience. The differences of what markets can, can provide. But you can definitely see there that if you draw too much, you're definitely going to run out of money earlier because there's not a single red line that gets past the, the 90 mark. Inflation, we've all spoken about it. I won't dwell on it, but it is public enemy number one, both in build-up and it, particularly in retirement. Advice is another danger. And the biggest danger of advice is that you don't get it but you do need to find somebody who can give you good advice. We, it's a question we get asked more than any other question at personal finance, is where do I get good advice? Well, we can't actually publish a name of good advisors because we don't know who is good and who is bad, but one thing that I've found over the years is that the best people come from the Financial Planning Institute and those that have got the qualification Certified Financial Planner. It's not an easy qualification to get. Um, Laura Dupree, who's taken over fr from me as editor, did the course a few years ago, over two years. Um, she's a very, very bright person, and she said it was one of the more difficult things she'd done. Um, but you can be sure that you're going to somebody who will be qualified. The other thing is, there's a very str strong code of conduct. Uh, the other thing I learned the other day and I'm pleased to announce it here, is that every financial advisor that is employed by Alexander Forbes has to have a certified, be a certified financial planner. And the next speaker, Andrew Leventis, is going to, is a certified financial planner, and you'll understand the skills that they bring when you hear him speak. And the other problem about advice is that you won't appreciate that advice, and it's a problem that John was talking about, dementia. If I look at the, the property syndications, uh, and there was a certain guy by the name of Dean Risk, I, I, I divide financial advisors into two categories, product floggers and advisors or planners. The product floggers just go and flog a product. Well, Mr. Risk went along to an old age home and he sold property syndications to everybody. Average age, about 79 years old. He just took advantage of them. Um, and it's a very real problem. So you must have an advisor you can actually trust. John spoke about having somebody you can trust, a lawyer or somebody. It's probably a good idea to have a financial advisor you can trust and a lawyer or somebody else that you can trust to, to look after your money um, when you get into that danger zone where you're, going, where you're going to be targeted by the scam artists. It's amazing. Every scam we deal with, it's nearly always elderly people who are the main targets. Um, and if you look... At Master Bond, there were 14 suicides. The first suicide with, um, with Share Max occurred last year. A person went and drove to the outside his offices, outside the office, former offices of Share Max, and shot himself in his car. I spoke to his daughter, and his daughter said he was absolutely desperate. He had nothing left, because that's the other thing. They'll try and get you to invest your all. So be very careful of that and have a structure in place for the venture. Planning for heirs, as I said, that's a risk. Um, there, are, there are the advantages, which Jenny Spell told to you this morning, but most people will not be able to sustain or have a sustainable income in retirement if that's the way you plan it. And in all likelihood, you're not going to leave them anything anyway, and you might make the wrong investment decisions in getting there. Choices, the things that you have to look at in deciding what choice you want are age, the older you are, the better the uh, 
guaranteed annuity and the lower the risk because if you're in a guaranteed annuity, you're not taking it. Interest rates, if interest rates are high, it's well worth locking in. So um, someone asked me this morning, is it a good idea to go and buy an RSA retail bond at the moment, which you can get 7.5% on for two years? Well, I don't quite know whether you should lock yourself in with interest rates likely to go up by another 1% to 2% in the next two years. So you definitely don't want to go for the 5% one because you'll go up. And the much the same applies with this in reverse, is the higher the interest rate, the more you want to lock yourself into a guaranteed annuity. What you're doing is you're buying yourself insurance against living too long. Um, the responsibility, we've all spoken about the dimension of things, is I've spoken about whether you want to leave your, your fortune to your ears, if you have a fortune, and then um, the locked in. The problem with a, a guaranteed annuity is once you've made that choice, you're in it for life. You can't change the type of guaranteed annuity, you can't increase the uh, change it to one where you're going to get uh, higher um, in, uh, in, increases in, in it on an annual basis, you're there. That's your decision. Whereas with a living annuity, you can at least switch to a guaranteed annuity. But this, I, can, I mentioned this earlier, but this is the important part, which shows the effect of age. Um, if you've retired at age, uh, age 55, you're going to get an implied yield of 9.33%, guaranteed from that annuity. These figures will be different because, as John explained, they change all the time. Um, he was actually the source of these figures at the time when it was put together as well, by the way. Thank you, John, again. Um, these actuaries aren't so bad after all. By the way, the reason why I became editor of personal finance, I got a couple of journalists together in the room, and they had a simple test. What's two and two? I knew immediately the answer was five. All the other idiots thought it was seven. Um, but if you look what happens, if you, if you delay the decision until age 70, you're getting a, an implied yield of 12.5%. Um, of now, that's good news. And it overcomes the problem of dementia and things like that, particularly if you, you get one of those guarantees um, for a certain period if you want to leave money or have to leave money to a uh, beneficiary. Um, you can also have multiple annuities, so you don't have to choose just one annuity. You can... A lot of advisors I've spoken to are now saying that one of the better solutions can be that you work out the absolute minimum income you need to have to survive, and you buy a guaranteed annuity with, with that money. The money that you can take more of a risk with, you use with a living annuity, because you'll at least know you can survive. And that, by the way, is so long as it's an escalating annuity to take account of, of inflation. You can split an annuity four ways, uh, uh, the money from your retirement fund, um, but the capital value of each annuity must exceed um, 25,000 and, uh, and it must have a, 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 or 150,000 a year. Um, and you can do this in one product. You, the increasing number of, of companies that are now selling a product where you can do it in phases, in lump sums or at certain ages, you can switch across. Um, without paying a whole lot of new round of costs. Because if you do it from a living annuity self, a freestanding, to a guaranteed annuity, there are going to be extra costs in the middle. Government has been very concerned about living annuities, and a result of which it is also proposing, um, we've got two proposals on the table at the moment. It's pr proposing what's called a var variable annuity, which in fact is very similar to um, a with profit annuity. It's to get you and the insurance company to share the risk. Um, the pension will vary depending on what market returns are um, and what's called the mortality experience of the group. So everybody in that um, portfolio, you all start dying young because of a, a repeat of the 1914 flu outbreak. Um, then the pensions will go up for those who, don't, who survive. Um, so the, the, fewer people who, the more people who die younger than expected, the, the pensions for those who survive will go up. Um, and the initial pension, like all other guaranteed pensions, will be based on what, how they're calculated now for guaranteed annuities. The other one is what's called a retirement income trust, and it's very similar to a living annuity, but it'll put further restraints on living annuities. It'll do things, the proposal is that you will only be able to draw down 
up to, it won't be this wide span of 25 to 17.5%. So in the initial, if you retire at um, 60, it might say you cannot withdraw down, draw down more than 4%. I don't, they haven't come up with any figures that we've seen yet, but that's how it will work. If you retire at age 80, you might be allowed to draw down 10 or 15%. And that's how they intend doing it. So to protect yourself from yourself, basically. Um, investment choice will be, will be limited too. Instead of this vast array of choices you have at the moment, you'll only be able to be offered um, balanced portfolios of different risk profiles. Um, you won't be able to go and buy shares, individual shares, as you can with some living annuities. Um, the death benefits will be much the same. Um, the underlying investments will have to be limited as they are with what's called the prudential investment um, limits that apply to retirement annuity funds and your, any um, occupational fund, where, for instance, you can't have more than 75% in equities. Um, the proposal is that the, they be even stricter than that what Regulation 28 has. Commissions will be limited, as well as costs, and you'll be able to transfer from one um, product to another um, if you find that it's being madly managed or something for that reason not just because you don't like the look of the company. That's the end of my presentation. Um, again, if you've got questions, send them to this number. Thank you very much for listening to me.